Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to come to consider this subject together, this very exciting and relevant subject of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And just before we start, you should be able to see on your screens our presentation, but this is a Prezi, not a PowerPoint, and therefore don't worry if you can't read everything because we will be zooming into the different sections. And so the whole presentation is on the screen, but we'll zoom in as we go along and you'll be able to read it as we go along. So it's a subject then that I'm sure you all know something about. It's been in the news and the media over the past years uh, fairly frequently. It's every few years, it seems, is a conflict which takes place, particularly in between the Gaza Strip and Israel when there's a mini war and things kick off again. And although it had been a little while, just last month was the most recent conflict when yet again there was a war between the Gaza Strip and the country of Israel, the Palestinians and the Israelis fighting. And it's said that during that time that there were over 4,000 rockets fired from the Gaza Strip by the Palestinians at the Israelis, and that in response the Israelis struck over a thousand militant targets in Gaza. And so it's a conflict that's very much still ongoing. And we come to consider the, the history of it and look at the background of this conflict. But the peculiar part about this talk is that we're also going to be looking and considering the future of this conflict. And the only reason that we can do this is through the Bible, through the word of God, which tells us the future because God is a God who knows the end from the beginning, who in his word has revealed things yet future to our time. And we can have confidence that this is the case by seeing prophecies which have already come to pass in recent times. Although the Bible was completed thousands of years ago, there's very significant prophecies which have only recently been fulfilled. And we'll see some of those as we go along. And so we'll see that we have great reason and confidence to believe that the Bible is the word of God. And therefore, it's relevant to us to guide us in our lives now. And also that the hope of eternal life, which it offers that that is a real true hope that we can choose to embrace. And so then we're going to step in and we're going to begin to consider the background to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we're going to start off by looking at the, the history from the Jewish perspective. <clears throat> As you can see on the screen, it's, it's been a, the hope of the Jewish people for thousands of years to be a free nation in the land of Israel with Jerusalem as their capital. And yet, although over the years they have possessed that territory, it's been so often that they have not been in, at peace. But this goes right back to around 2000 BC. The first few slides will have an approximate date in the top right corner. So we're going back around 4,000 years ago to the time of a man called Abraham, where the history of this conflict is perhaps best to start here for the Jewish people. Because Abraham is very important man as regards this conflict goes in the history of the whole nation. And so if you're able to come with me to the first book of the Bible, to Genesis, and to Genesis chapter 13, we read about this man who is called in the Bible, is called by the name Abram, and also the name Abraham. And so in Genesis 13, we read about Abram, and how God makes promises to him in verses 14 to 18. In verse 14, we find it says the Lord, and it's in capital letters, is speaking unto Abram. And so that's the God of the Bible. It's the name Yahweh when you look at the original Hebrew text. This is God speaking to Abraham. And he says to him in verse 14, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward and westward. And so where is Abram at this time? Well, Verse 3 tells us that Abraham's in a place between Bethel and Ai. So this is, in modern day context, it's 
kind of in the middle of the land of Israel, what we know as Israel. Here's Abraham standing in the middle of Israel and he's told to look all around him. For verse 15, God says, all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And so we see that God is promising to Abraham. First off, this man Abraham, he doesn't have any children. But God's promising that there's going to be so many children which come from him. He's going to be like the dust of the earth. And so he's going to have a lot of descendants. And God is also promising that he's going to give to Abraham the land that we now know of as Israel. And so God did give Abraham a son so that these promises could be fulfilled. And his son that we're going to track at the moment that is called Isaac. He had other sons as well, but Isaac is the son we see to whom the promise, the promise is passed. Because when we come forward a few chapters to Genesis 26, we see that God now appears to Isaac, Abraham's son. And he tells him in the first couple of verses of Genesis 26, we see God speaking to Isaac and he, he tells him to not go into Egypt, but rather to verse 3, to sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father, and I'll make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so we see that the promise that was given to Abraham is passed through to his son Isaac. That Isaac is also going to have his seed multiplied, his descendants multiplied, that he too is having this promise of the land passed through. And then this really becomes really relevant because Isaac has a son called Jacob. And we read in Jacob, of Jacob in Genesis 35. And in verses 9 to 13, we see the promises pass again through this line. It's gone from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. In Genesis 35, verses 9 to 13, we read in verse 9 that God appears to Jacob. And he says in verse 10 that his name is going to be Israel. And so this is why we know of a country today called Israel, because this man Jacob had his name changed by God to Israel and his descendants became known as the nation of Israel. Jacob's descendants were greatly multiplied in the fulfillment of God's promise. Or the beginning of the fulfillment of it. And so to this day, there is a nation of Israel who have descended from this one man, Jacob, who by God was given the name Israel. And so God has said unto me in verse 11, Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins, which we've seen. And verse 12 says, And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And so the promise has passed through then to Jacob, who is also called Israel, and therefore through to the nation of Israel. And we find the Bible tracks much of the history of the descendants of Israel, of the, this nation of the Jewish people, whom this promises was given to, according to the Bible record, to therefore the Jewish people. And we note actually, when we think about the current day situation, as it's kind of a Jewish versus Arab controversy. And the Arabs, many of them were descended from other sons of Abraham. But the promises weren't passed through that, their line. The particular land of Israel was passed through the Jewish line. So this is how the Bible sets it out before us, that God had intended the Jewish people would have the land of Israel. And so they did. As we say, Israel had many descendants. They became a whole nation without many of them. And God did give them the land. But before God gave them the land, if you can come across just forward a few books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy, and chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 is talking at a time now when Jacob's descendants have multiplied. And 
There's now thousands and thousands of them. And they multiplied in the land of Egypt, but God brought them out of Egypt, as the Bible record tells us, and he led them through the wilderness that he might give them that land which he had promised to Abraham. But before he ever gave them the land, a prophecy was made in Deuteronomy 28. You'll see that Deuteronomy 28 is a really big chapter. It starts off by saying that if the Jewish people are to listen to God, that they will be blessed. But it very quickly turns, and most of the chapter is filled with curses which will come upon them if they don't listen to God. And so most of the chapter is filled of curses which the Bible record makes clear will come to pass upon them, which sadly many of these, many of these curses have now come to pass upon the nation of Israel. But we want to particularly look at the end. So starting in verse 63, God said to Israel before they ever entered and possessed the land promised Abraham, he said to them that it shall come to pass that as Yahweh rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so Yahweh will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And Yahweh shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And it goes on in verse 65, Among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But Yahweh shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have non assurance of thy life. And so we get the picture that terrible things are prophesied of Israel. It's prophesied that they are going to be unfaithful, and as a result, that God will remove them from the land which he hasn't yet given them. <clears throat> but they'll be scattered across the earth, and that they will be in an awful situation where they find themselves. And as history testifies, the word of God has come true and they've been terribly persecuted from country to country. And so they're warned then that they are going to be cast out of their land if they're disobedient. And so we move forward again, and we move forward to the time of AD 70. And now, shortly after the time period where we just were, Israel had entered into the land and God had given them the land of Israel and they'd remained in that land for hundreds of years except for a period of about 70 years in which the Babylonians temporarily took them captive but during most of that time Israel were in the land the Jewish people had a country called Israel at one time it was a kingdom with kings ruling over it and yet when we come to AD 70 everything changes at this time shortly after the time of the Lord Jesus Christ the Jewish people, they're in the land, but they're subject to the Roman Empire. And when we get to AD 70, there's great conflict between the Romans and the Jewish people. And in AD 70, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. It's burned. The temple that the Jewish people had was burned. And the Jewish people themselves, over the succeeding years, were scattered from the around the time of AD 70 up to 8135 and 8135 is particularly relevant for us because in this time there was a Roman emperor called Hadrian and there was a Jewish revolt the Bar Kokhba revolt and yet the Romans were able to suppress it and it was perhaps as a result of this that Hadrian is an infuriated maybe and he he tries to completely remove all trace of the Jewish people and so he renames Israel to Palestine seemingly as an attempt to get rid of the connection to the Jewish people. He also tries to rename Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina, something which never really took hold. But as you'll see, the, the name Palestine did take hold in a much greater way. And so this is why today we often talk about the idea of Palestine. We hear that in the news because Hadrian renamed the country of Israel to Palestine. It seems he wanted to get rid of that Jewish connection. He didn't come up with the name, but he uh, popularized it then, it would seem, because he was the one that renamed Israel to Palestine. So that's a key date in the conflict, and this is AD 135, so still almost 2,000 years ago that we're speaking. 
And so as we say at this time, then the Jewish, the Jews were scattered from the land of Israel. The, the land of Israel ceased to be. The people were scattered from it and the name was renamed to Palestine. And so what befell the Jewish people in the subsequent years? Well, the, the Jews in the Catholic lands, you might know, were terribly persecuted by the Catholics, those who claimed to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet from their actions towards the Jewish people and others, clearly betrayed him. But in the Muslim lands, it seemed that the Jews did a lot better. The Jews did better in the Arab lands, that is, up until around the year 600 AD, which is another, another pivotal date, because in 600 AD, a man called Muhammad came along, who introduced a new faith, who came along and, and brought Islam. And so in around 600 AD, and here's a quote from the book from Time Immemorial by Joan Peters. <clears throat> and she says that according to the historian Bernard Lewis, when Muhammad came along, he originally was trying to get more followers. And so he tried to get Jews to follow him. And so initially, he actually took some Jewish practices as, as part of the Muslim religion, and that included praying towards Jerusalem, keeping the fast of Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, trying to get more Jewish adherents. And yet that didn't really work. The Jews didn't really follow Muhammad. And so it says here that Muhammad subsequently substituted Mecca for Jerusalem and dropped many of the Jewish practices. And it goes on to say that three years later, Arab hostility against the Jews commenced when the Meccan army exterminated the Jewish tribe of Qureza. <coughs> and so now we find that things are not so pleasant between the Arabs and the Jews. And what happens is that the Jews become, along with any other non-Muslims, they're known as Dimmers, a non-Muslim living in a Muslim land. And in essence, they're a second class citizen. And so at best, from this time period onwards, it seems that the Jews were second-class citizens that lived in Muslim lands, at best, and at worst, being persecuted, like their brothers in Western countries being persecuted by the Catholics. And so very much the, the prophecy of Deuteronomy 28 was being fulfilled. The word of God was being outworked, and the accuracy of God's word is seen in the terrible suffering that befell the Jewish people as God had prophesied thousands of years ago. And to illustrate this point, we can consider how, how many Jews there were in the Arab world in 1948, which was a turning point. And the reason 1948 was a turning point is, is that's the year in which the state of Israel was declared. That's the year in which the Jews had somewhere to move to. Or in a sense, you could say they had somewhere to flee to. Because in 1948, there were around 850,000 Jews in the Arab world, it said. But then in 2014, there were only around 3,700. And so when the state of Israel was declared, when the Jews were given somewhere to flee to, and things got even worse because of the state of Israel being declared and the Arabs not being happy, life for Jews was terrible in Arab worlds. And many of them therefore fled, as you can see, and it seems there's around... 850,000 Jewish refugees, which left the Arab world and many of them ended up in the nation of Israel. And so this brings us very close to our time when we come to 1948 then, that just over 70 years ago, that the state of Israel was declared, that the Jews had been slowly returning back to the land for some time, and uh, uh, quite difficult conditions and of course many of them returning from the ashes of the Holocaust and in 1948 the UN after their vote the Israel was able to declare be declared as a state but as a result of this the, the Arabs that were living in that area and the surrounding areas were not happy and they invaded Israel in 1948 so there's this newly born nation they, they've just returned out of the ashes of the Holocaust and they straightway find themselves attacked and they're vastly outnumbered. You can see on the map there that Israel is in blue. It's a country about the size of Wales. And you can see surrounding it in green that the Arab nations, 
they didn't all attack, but a few of the, the nearer ones did. So Israel was vastly outnumbered. And yet, surprisingly, and as Bible believers had to expect from prophecy, the Jews did survive. In fact, Israel defeated the Arabs. And as we see today, that Israel is still there as a country because God preserved them. And so there was a shocking Arab defeat when this newly born state of Israel managed to survive against the great Arab nations that were well established around them. And so Bible prophecy began to come to pass. As we will see later, God had prophesied in his word that not only would the Jews be scattered, but they would also be regathered. And now they had begun to be regathered according to the word of God. And yet this really brings us up to how that the conflict began because this led to a refugee crisis. So in any war, there's, there's normally consequences and often pretty unpleasant consequences. And a result of this war was there were many refugees. There were many Arab refugees which had been living in the territory of Israel. And yet there's a bit more to the background that we don't often hear that's not often publicized. And so we're going to just look into this a bit more, which will begin to show us that there's more to this conflict and it's, it's not as simple as it may initially appear. And it begins to show us that there's something going on, which we'll see ultimately is what we'd expect from the Bible. So first off, here's a quote from the Syrian prime minister who is said to have said that since 1948, we've been demanding the return of the refugees to their homes, that's to the Palestinian refugees. But we ourselves are the ones who encourage them to leave. Because what happened in 1948 is these Jews had managed to struggle their way back to the land of Israel. And they were there about to proclaim themselves a state. But the Arab nations surrounding them, they said to the Arabs living in the land, leave the land because we're going to come in and we'll wipe out the Jews and then you can have the land straight back. And it all seemed pretty simple, except for the fact of the great surprise that Israel actually somehow, with God's help, they survived. And so the, the Arab nations, they, it seems they sent radio messages and got the Arabs in the land to leave. And yet when they left, they weren't able to defeat the Jewish people. And so there was a problem because the surrounding Arab neighbours, they didn't look after the, the Arabs they'd encouraged to leave. And instead, it seems that they just put them in refugee camps. And so you begin to have a problem with these Palestinians, which become homeless. But as we say, there's a, there's a bit more to this. And you can get an idea when you look at the UN, the United Nations. The United Nations has two refugee agencies. It has a refugee agency called UNRWA, which is a refugee agency for the Palestinian refugees. And then it has another refugee agency for the world, the rest of the world's refugees. And so you can see straight away, there's something a bit strange there. There's these two agencies, the one for the whole world, except for the Palestinians, and there's one for just the Palestinians. And along with this goes a unique definition for a Palestinian refugee. And so the normal definition for refugees on the screen there is, is as we kind of expect that there's some people that due to a war or something like that, they find themselves homeless. And they perhaps end up in a new country and then they have children and their children become citizens of that new country and slowly the problem goes away. But not so for a Palestinian refugee. For a Palestinian refugee, they have this, this very narrow definition. It is people whose normal residence was Palestine during the period of 1st of June 1946 to the 15th of May 1948, who lost both home and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 conflict. And so what we're seeing is it's a particular definition, which means the Arabs, which in theory could have been living in the land of Israel for just two years, can still be classed as a refugee. And it's a definition which is an inflating the numbers of the Palestinian refugees and uh, worse than this, the Palestinians, it seems, are the only refugees in the whole world who can pass that refugee status onto their children. And so normally the problem of refugees goes away as the generations continue on because the children are born in new countries and they, 
get new citizenship. But not so with the Palestinian refugees, as they have children, the problem grows and multiplies and you end up with more and more refugees. And so what we're seeing is that there's something going on here more on a national scale. And sadly, it would appear in a sense that the Palestinian refugees are just being used as pawns in a far greater political battle. And so we see that there's this problem of many Arab refugees. Again, here's another quote, and this is one from the PLO, the Palestine Liberalization Organization, where Zahir Hussein is said to have said that the Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality today, there's no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. And so what we're seeing is that a lot of what we hear in the news seems to be from this conflict, which is a great political battle that is going on in the world. And sadly, the Israelis are, of course, suffering the consequences. And so too are the Palestinian refugees, which for the normal person, they just seem to be pawns in this, this greater battle, whereas the leadership, oftentimes, when you look into it, can be rather corrupt. But the other thing that we're just beginning to highlight is that there's another side to this story. And we say this because as Christadelphians, we're not political. We don't politically support Israel. We don't politically support Palestine. We would say that they are they're both corrupt, that Israel is far from a perfect nation, that the Bible history testifies that this is the case. And yet, what we're pointing out here is that the general media seems to be very much biased. In fact, there was a Bowden report commissioned into the BBC and they afterwards flatly refused to give the, the results of that commission, which kind of strongly implies to you that the, they found that the BBC is strongly biased against Israel. And we often hear only the one side of the story. It's always the Palestinian refugees we hear about. On the screen, you can see real refugees from the 1950s, but these are in fact Jewish refugees. Because as we said before, there was around 850,000 Jewish refugees, it seems, from Arab countries, which is about the same number that we, the figures that we get for the amount of Palestinian refugees from Israel. And yet Israel absorbed a lot of their Jewish refugees, whereas the, the Palestinian ones, many of them have been stuck in camps even by the, the other Arab countries. And so there's a problem which perpetually goes on, which seems to be used for a greater political struggle than the individuals involved. But the reason this is particularly interesting to a Bible believer is it begins to show that there's this narrative which is very much biased against the Jewish people, which is exactly what we're expecting as we will see further on. Now Muhammad is said to have said that war is deception and if he did then he would probably be quite proud of the Arab conflict. And so let's just think a little bit more about that, the current conflicts and the different wars which take place. So the situation today is that you've got the Jewish people have the nation of Israel and certain areas are known as Israel proper, whereas other areas and what's often called the West Bank is dividing into areas A, B and C. And they're kind of ranging from more and less Palestinian slash Israeli control. And these areas, they tend to be free from conflict. You occasionally get a terrorist attack when it tends to be the Palestinians breaking with a knife or try and drive a truck into someone. And yet the, the Israelis, of course, have got the superior police and such, and often the terrorists get shot dead. But the wars tend to happen between another area, which is on the coast of Israel, and that's the Gaza Strip. Now, the Gaza Strip, back in 2005, the Israelis unilaterally just withdrew from it. Ariel Sharon pulled out the Jewish people and so, in essence, gave it to the Arabs. And then the Arabs held elections and Hamas won, which is why we often hear of Hamas. Now, Hamas kicked out the opposing party, Fatah, and so they've had control of the Strip ever since. And so it's Hamas, which um, I think it's said to be a terrorist organization by different nations across the globe, they are the ones that often cause the troubles because they are always firing rockets across into Israel. And 
it's hard to imagine really isn't it imagine if wales suddenly was taken over by terrorists and living in england we suddenly have all these rockets flying across at us and so occasionally the israelis retaliate and we have a mini battle but it's really interesting that when these battles occur you often hear the term war crime being used and when you think about war crimes these are the sorts of things which are war crimes which you can see on the screen it's very easy and clear to see hamas is guilty of war crimes because they very much fire at civilians and they very much try to use civilians to shield themselves and to store for example their weapons in a school that's the sort of thing they seem to do they also seem perhaps to be happy to use child soldiers and they, they do these things which the world would class as war crimes but the point we're making is it's really strange that although it's it's pretty clear that this is the case with just a, a bit of research it tends to be israel that's accused of the war crimes and we can understand that Israel is a more powerful nation here. But why is it that they seem to take all the brunt of the media attention? And when we look a bit closer, we see that Israel is quite unique in some ways. When they're attacking their enemy, they often make phone calls and drop leaflets ahead of time to say we're going to attack this building because we don't want any civilians to be killed, but we want to try and destroy these rockets, let's say. And so we see that they do these things to try and minimize civilian casualty. In fact, a, a British colonel said at the U UN Human Rights Council in 2009, talking of one of the previous conflicts, that during the Operation Cast Lead, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, did more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any other army in the history of warfare. And as we say, we're sure that Israel is a far from perfect nation. But you can see that they're in a very difficult situation. And so why is it that they always get attacked? Even in a country like the UK, where Jews are more relatively safe, they're, they're still not, not easy being a Jewish person living in the UK sometimes. But it's not as bad as certain countries around the world. And yet so often the media is biased against Israel. Why should this be the case? Well, this quote kind of sums up the conflict as as we can see how it works, that Israel uses its missiles to protect its children, while Hamas uses its children to protect its missiles. That's a quote from the ex-Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu. And it neatly summarizes the conflict when you look into things, that this is so often the case is that the, the Muslim religion has quite a different mindset, and in a sense it, it glorifies in death. And it seems that they're quite happy to produce civilian casualties sometimes because it, it can help their cause, it can get them good media attention and such. Whereas Israel's more like the Western nations, which of course very much tries to protect their children. And so we begin to see when we, we dig into this conflict a bit more that Israel is far from perfect, but they also do find themselves in a very difficult situation. And more than this, they're, they're always being told to negotiate and they have often tried to negotiate and they always get turned down and it's not surprising really when we consider what the Hamas charter is when it clearly says that Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it and the reality is it's hard to negotiate with your enemy when their stated aim is to obliterate you and so we have very much the kind of situation harkening back to Psalm 120 that Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And so we'll just look at one example to illustrate this. In 1967, there was a six day war. Israel found themselves far outnumbered by the Arabs that were invading. And then there was a, a, an attack happening and the result of the Six Day War was though Israel was far outnumbered, they managed to defeat their enemies in six days and rest on the seventh, uh, almost as it were resting upon the Sabbath day like Genesis chapter one. And they had this amazing victory over the Arabs and you think that if the Arabs were ever going to negotiate, it would be at this time. And so it seems that the Jews were there wanting to negotiate, negotiate peace, even willing, as we've seen in the past, to, to give up land to try and get peace. And yet the Arab heads, they, they met together and they declared very clearly there's going to be no peace with Israel, there's going to be no recognition of Israel, there's going to be no negotiations with Israel. And so we seem to be in a conflict which is interminable, how are we ever 
going to end such a conflict? It seems the Arabs won the whole land and Israel obviously aren't just going to give up and jump into the sea. And Israel, although they might offer some land, they're not going to give it all up. And we seem to be in this situation that just cannot be resolved. But what we've hopefully begun to see is that if we've just heard of this conflict before from brief news clips from the BBC, for example, we've probably heard of this conflict in a very biased way. And if you go in and you try and research the history of this conflict a bit more and you try and look at the news from different angles, from the, the Arab newspapers, perhaps, and the English newspapers and the American newspapers and also the Israeli newspapers and try and get more of a balanced perspective, the often size we seem to get just the one narrative. And why should this be the case? Well, what we're clearly seeing is that there's growing hatred for the nation of Israel in the world. That there's great anti-Semitism. But the anti-Semitism seen in the past 2,000 years in the many different pogroms and the culmination of the Holocaust is far from over. Although in the wake of the Holocaust, at last the nations had some sympathy on the Jewish people, and the UN allowed them to establish their state. Since that time, anti-Semitism is once again on the rise. And it would appear no matter how hard Israel tries to do things in the correct and proper way as the, the UN would have them do it, they are still hated, they are still attacked, and they are still despised. And this is what Bible believers expect, because the Bible prophesies to us that the time is coming in which Israel once again is going to be invaded, in which the nations are going to gather themselves together and invade the nation of Israel. And this brings us then to our reading, if you can come back to Joel chapter 3, which is where we, we're pretty much going to be finishing it, in Joel chapter 3. As we bring things together, we've begun to see how God's word has been accurate. It's been accurate over the past 2,000 years when the Jewish people were scattered from their land as prophesied, when they were persecuted from place to place and found themselves in a dire situation as prophesied. But also now, when only going back just over 70 years, again, the word of God was fulfilled. When Bible believers had been waiting for hundreds, thousands of years for the Jews to return back to their land, because the Bible had prophesied so, that this has now begun to happen just, just over 70 years ago. And the previous years in which the Jews were returning. And so we see from Joel 3, as was read, that the Bible did prophesy that the Jews would return back to their land. Because what's the, the context of Joel 3? Well, verse 1 says it's, Behold, in those days and in that time, in, in which days and which time? It's in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. That phrase here in the King James Bible, bring again the captivity, it means the Jews are going to be restored back to the land. It's talking about Judah, so the, the Jews are going to come back to Judah. That's, a, that's an area of Israel. And in essence, it's saying they're going to return back to the land of Israel. And this is exactly what we've seen, that they returned back and they became a state in 1948, as recent as that. And you'll note, it doesn't just say Judah, it says, and Jerusalem. And it's in that order, they're going to return back to the land of Judah, and they're also going to return back to Jerusalem. And when the Jews first returned back to Israel, after coming up to 2,000 years of being scattered all across the globe, having survived as a unique nation for all that time, and now returning back according to Bible prophecy, they didn't initially have Jerusalem. But this prophecy said that they would. And so that wasn't until 1967 they also got Jerusalem. And so we see here a very key point that Israel did return back to their land, as was expected from Joel 3 verse 1 and other prophecies. And we see at this time verse 2 that says, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and parted my land. And Joel presents for us this picture of these nations which are hostile to Israel. If we'd read the rest of the chapter, we'd have read about the nations assembling themselves and coming and attacking Israel, as other prophecies such as Ezekiel 38 tell. 
And so this is why it's so relevant what we've been seeing is this bias in the media. That this is constant conflict that Israel doesn't really have a way out. And whatever they seem to do, they are hated and they are attacked by the media. And this is what we'd expect because Joel sets before us that the time is coming which nations are going to group and gather together and invade the land of Israel. And so it's no surprise to see anti-Semitism arising, to see Jews all across the globe fleeing back to the land of Israel because of they're being scared for their lives and Israel seems to be the only place of refuge. And then when they get to Israel, they find themselves under rockets attacks and they're not allowed to respond without being accused of war crimes and such. And so we see the Jewish people are in this terrible situation, but we also see that the, the scene of prophecy and what we expect as Bible believers is being set before us, that this hatred of Israel is growing. And so we believe that Bible prophecy will take place, that the nations will gather themselves and invade Israel. And particularly, what we find in Joel 3 verse 4 is that there's a hostile nation living in the region of Tyre and Zidon and there's a hostile nation living in the region of what's called here in the AV the coasts of Palestine that is it's the coast of the land of Israel or kind of in the region it's kind of the, the Philistine territory if you're familiar with that from your Bibles that this is basically in effect kind of the area of the Gaza Strip and so we'd expect from this prophecy that there'll be those in Tyre and Zidon which are hostile to Israel it's Indeed, there are, if you think of Hezbollah, for example. We'd also expect there to be a hostile presence to Israel upon the coast in, say, the territory of the Gaza Strip. And this is even a set, an even more recent prophecy, perhaps. Many of us may not have been alive in 1948, maybe not in 1967. But perhaps most of us were alive in 2005 when, as we've already said, Ariel Sharon, for whatever crazy reason from the Jewish perspective, decided to withdraw the Jews out of the Gaza Strip. Since that time, as we said, Hamas has taken over and uses it to fire rockets from close proximity into the land of Israel. Since he did that and Hamas has taken over, we now find a hostile nation right there in the coast of Palestine, as we'd expect for this prophecy in Joel 3 to be fulfilled. And so we see, coming right up to our time, that the Bible prophecy is being fulfilled around us and so we live in exciting times from that perspective but how then is this conflict ever going to be resolved well what we see then is that israel finding themselves at enmity with the palestinians along with those in tyre and zidon and what it appears then is, as we, if we had more time to look at other prophecies, as we say, the nations are going to gather themselves together. They're going to invade the land of Israel. And so it appears that at this time, the Palestinians, who at the moment, of course, are, are far outgunned by Israel, they're going to use the opportunity to try and get revenge upon Israel. They're going to try and take Israel and they're going to even, it would appear, once again, sell them as slaves, perhaps a similar thing to what I think ISIS did recently, maybe. So verse 5 says, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold into the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. And so it seems they're going to seize an opportunity to attack the Jewish people. And yet God will then intervene. And this becomes clear from other prophecies. But this is the time when Christophans believe that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. He will save the Jewish people from the invasion of the nations. And we see here that verse 7, that God says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place where you have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for Yahweh hath spoken it. And so there's a prophecy here that God himself is going to intervene upon the those like Hamas in the, in the Gaza Strip would appear if they're the ones that are still around when this takes place. That their hostility is going to be recompensed and that God is going to remove them to where it says the Sabines here. Now, Joel was initially written in Hebrew and in the Hebrew it says Sheba, that is, it's the people of Sheba. 
And so they're going to be removed, it would appear, to the territory of Sheba. And so where is that? Well, if we look on a map, it's believed that Sheba is in this territory, which is kind of around Saudi Arabia and Yemen in modern day terms. So you can see it there on the map with Dida and Sheba. And Sheba therefore equates to kind of this sort of area. And so it would appear that we're told in surprising detail the future of this conflict, that when God intervenes, he is going to remove the Palestinians out of the land so that the Jewish people can have that land which he promised to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob and put an end to this conflict so that there might be peace at last. But there's perhaps just a bit more to finish and so we'll go to one final prophecy because ultimately the Bible tells us there will be peace between Jew and Arab. Lord Jesus Christ isn't going to return just to bring peace to the Jewish people or just to Israel, but in fact to the whole world, to Jew and to Arab, and also to us, if we prepare ourselves for that time. And so our final prophecy, then it's, it's Isaiah chapter 60, and the first seven verses. It's a prophecy which is directed to Zion, which is, you could almost see it as another name for Jerusalem, the, the capital of Israel. Uh, we know that from verse 14. So it says to Zion, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of Yahweh is risen upon thee. And so it's a complete reversal of fortunes for the Jewish people here. They're going to get light. They're going to get glory. And it says in verse 3, the Gentiles, that, that means non-Jewish people, are going to come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about thee and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far. And thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. And we see the people flowing back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. And we want to particularly focus in verses 6 and 7. Because verse 6 says, The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. Or they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of Yahweh. And so what we believe is the Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish a worldwide kingdom in Jerusalem and he's going to teach all the nations about the God of Israel. And so we see that the Arabs are going to come up to learn of the God of Israel. And even from Sheba, where we saw it would appear the Palestinian people are probably going to be removed too. Even they are going to come up to praise Yahweh, to praise the God of Israel. And even more than this, verse 7 says that the flocks of Kedar, we saw in that psalm earlier, that Kedar was kind of set as this nation of Arab hostility, of hatred of the Jews. Even flocks of Kedar are going to be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. The house there in the Bible, it means the temple. And so we believe as was prophesied of the son of David, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will build a temple in Jerusalem. And this will be used to teach the nations about the God of Israel. And even flocks from Kedar, are going to be used it would appear in that temple service and so the final picture that it shows us is that there's actually peace between jew and arab because now god's son is reigning as king now the nations are all learning about righteousness they all will have been judged jew and arab and all gentiles and righteousness will be established in place and that will result in peace and so this is the hope that is set before us that that God's going to intervene upon this earth. He's going to glorify this earth. And the hope we have is eternal life there. Interacting with the Jews and the Gentiles and teaching them about God. And we can have the hope to do this if we choose now to prepare ourselves by learning from the word of God. And committing our lives unto God. That we can be there to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. To see this unequaled peace. To see a time in which the conflict of Israel and the conflict of all the world is past. And looking beyond that time even to a time in which everyone who is left has been immortalised. Everyone who is left shows the glory of God. When there's great righteousness and peace and we can live forever in that time. And so hopefully we've seen this evening that the Bible is very relevant to us. It has prophecies which speak of even our time which we are currently living in and beyond into the future and so the promises that have been fulfilled in the past give us confidence that those yet for the future will be fulfilled and it just remains to us whether or not we're going to embrace the promises which have been laid out in the bible if we too want to have a hope 
of eternal life according to the word of God written down before us.